Welcome back to Blitzscaling a Startup. This is Chris Ye, and I'm delighted today to be joined by an amazing guest. Our guest today is one of the most successful venture capital investors in the world. The venture capital he funded, Hoff, is now at over $1 billion in assets under management. And you've probably heard of some of the companies that he's backed, like SpaceX, Epic Games, and UiPath. Furthermore, the, our guest today, Ansi Suiris, has a family that has an incredible legacy of entrepreneurship in his home country of Egypt, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Welcome, Ansi. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Chris. Super happy to be here. So for the sake of folks who are listening, maybe you can give us a quick overview of your life and how you came to start Hoff Capital, because you, know, you are definitely not the first member of your family to achieve great things in business. Yeah, thank you, Chris. I'm uh, Egyptian. Um, I was uh, born and raised in, uh, in, uh, in Egypt, and I've uh, uh, attended a German school um, following kind of my father's footsteps and decided that um, wanted to take on a, a challenge and, 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 and do my university studies in the U.S. So I uh, uh, ended up, uh, actually it was me and my Hoff co-founder, Hisham, where we, we were the only two German students in Egypt that applied to U.S. schools. Everyone was looking at Germany and Egypt as sort of the two natural landing spots for college. Um, so I ended up in MIT. I studied mechanical engineering. Um, was really amazed by you know, how I grew up and what the U.S. was able to, to teach me along the way. Um, you know, bearing in mind that, it, you know, very different cultures, a lot to adapt to. Um, but I really felt like there was, was tremendous opportunity to bring how, you know, how I was brought up to bring my cultural and uh, heritage to kind of this uh, world that now I've uh, uh, continued to do business in and continue to, uh, um, to, to be excited about. So... Uh, um, but yeah, I started my career as an investment banker uh, in New York, and then Fadi and Hisham, who are my two co-founders and, and partners at Hoff, uh, both Egyptian as well, uh, when we decided one day that uh, we want to build a business together. Um, it was sort of that startup mindset. Every one of us had touched that world, uh, had bumped into a lot of great entrepreneurs along the way, and realized that we had a unique, unique opportunity to uh, build a global investment hub and bring sort of a lot of our relationships and a lot of the uh, the, the, the folks that we were connected to uh, across the world to see how we can position ourselves and invest in, uh, you know, uh, cutting edge technologies in, in, in the U.S. And, and, and globally, frankly, as well. Yeah. Well, I have to tell you, you know, it, as you tell your story, there's so many interesting points of commonality in the sense that I spent five years of my life in Cambridge, in Central Square, in Kendall Square, not too far from MIT. I certainly visited the MIT campus many times. That was when I was working at D.E. Shaw way back at the beginning. So definitely love being in Cambridge. Uh, I must admit, I suspect that I was not working as hard as you were because MIT is legendarily intense, <laughs> especially on the engineering side. So I can imagine you had many, many a sleepless night. Uh, and I also had the opportunity to visit your home country in 2019, right before the pandemic. I went to Cairo and spoke at the Rise oh. Up Summit and just yeah. enjoyed it so much, you know, getting a chance to be in the country, to experience the culture, to see, you know, again, thousands of years of, of legacy. It was a remarkable experience. I'm really glad I got a chance to do that. Great. Yeah, no, on, on MIT, I had a lot of sleepless nights, but I feel my German kind of upbringing in the German school really prepared me well for that challenge. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> so obviously, as you mentioned, you and your co-founders are from Egypt. That's all part of the MENA region. I've had the opportunity over the past few years to visit the MENA region multiple times. So I've been to Egypt, as I mentioned, to Riyadh in Saudi Arabia, Muscat in Oman, Doha in Qatar, Dubai. I still haven't made it to Abu Dhabi for some reason. I guess that's coming up next. <laughs> and it is really remarkable, right? This is one of the markets that I think is really emerging for a variety of reasons. The obvious one, which applies more to the Saudi Arabias of the world, is the vast carbon uh, carbon wealth that's available of which you know, Saudi Arabia is deploying on a whole series of projects including Neom 
But obviously, as you know, Saudi Arabia and Egypt are very closely aligned because in many ways Egypt provides the human capital to complement the financial capital of Saudi Arabia. And overall, the entire region has these incredible demographics. It's a young region. There's an emerging middle class. It's a really exciting time in the MENA region. So talk to me a little bit about sort of your perspective there, right? You, you come from Egypt. You've spent time in the region. You're using this perspective to help you invest. What's happening? What's your perspective? And what are your hopes for the next couple of decades? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's funny because when we first were, you know, in our early days at Hoff and deciding how to position ourselves, how to build the firm, uh, we used to get a lot of questions around why not exclusively focus on building a, a you know, regional VC firm that's, you know, Egypt focused, regionally focused. Uh, and the answer back then was we want to invest where, you know, the best entrepreneurs are from, where the best investors are and get you guys excited to build that e infrastructure and that ecosystem for entrepreneurship to, to rise and shine. And I feel, um, you know, we could have played a small role in, in how, you know, interest grew in this asset class, in this space, which is directly correlated with governments supporting entrepreneurs, supporting talent hubs uh, in our region. And I think, frankly, we started to see uh, a lot of these results, I think, um, you know, Technology in emerging markets where there are a lot of, a lot more basic problems to solve for is where a lot of the opportunities lie for, you know, tech entrepreneurs and solving for real world problems where there's a real need is very different than solving for something that's nice to have or that simplifies something in your life or in your process. So, um, I feel like that has, has started to also attract global investors to look at how to invest in, in, in entrepreneurs in our regions. And I feel like this is a time where these regions need a lot more investment in these long-term projects and, and long-term, you know, entrepreneurs naturally think long-term and you need to find support systems to, to give them that. And we're seeing governments starting to play a big role, especially Saudi with their mandates yeah. um, to bring also talent to the region, to bring global investors to have incentives to get them there. Uh, because that's where the entrepreneurs will learn from as well, you know, increased competition, uh, fighting for talent. And I feel like that's definitely catching up to what we saw Silicon Valley build over the last 25 years. Now, many of our many of our listeners may not be as familiar with modern Egypt. Of course, they know about Egypt because of its grand history and they in their minds picture the pyramids. Most of them don't realize the pyramids are just outside of Cairo. <laughs> it's not like you go into the desert to see them. They're right there. And Egypt itself is a really dynamic place. Can you talk a little bit about where you see Egypt today and what are some of the lessons that entrepreneurs here in Silicon Valley should be learning from entrepreneurs in Egypt, in the MENA region? Uh, what are the things that you know, maybe we have forgotten because of the many decades we've spent as an established startup hub that we should perhaps be relearning from some of your experiences? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think we're, it's a timely question and it's a timely topic because emerging markets are also suffering with sort of the, the macro cloud that's surrounding the world right now uh, with what's happening in Russia and Ukraine and how that's impacting some of our economies. And I think this is where you start to see entrepreneurs navigate um, these markets because I think, yes, funding can dry up in general in this asset class during tough times where interest rates are high and whatnot. But I feel in, in our side of the world, that's where you know, capital dries up much quicker. So I feel when, when we have interacted at least with entrepreneurs that we try to back uh, across Africa as well and, and emerging markets in general, we see that they face a lot more challenges that are outside of their control. So it's really people who, you know, put their destiny in their own hand, people who go the extra mile, who can endure uh, tough times, I feel are the ones that build businesses that are here to stay and, and create long-term value. And this is where the emerging market risk profile plays a, a role, that if you uh, are an investor that has experience in those markets, that understands what it takes um, through you know the relationships that you have and the entrepreneurs that you've been able and, and fortunate to be around, you, you kind of get as well a better sense of what it takes to, to really build something that is uh, you know, generational and that will make a huge impact on these markets. Um, so I think, yeah, it's an interesting time. And we're seeing also in Silicon Valley, we're seeing entrepreneurs try to solve problems that are more global. Um, how to, you know, connectivity has enabled 
uh, a lot of this knowledge transfer between different markets and people uh, I'm sure know a lot more about Egypt today, for example, than they did like maybe 40, 50 years ago when it's just in school and, and in classes. I think now social media, the power of that is, is also to do with the entrepreneurs learning from each other around the world. Yeah. I th are there are a couple of threads I hear as you speak. One thread is certainly a thread of, of impact, as you mentioned. Startups may have an even greater impact on emerging markets in terms of solving these very real problems as opposed to these convenience problems. And it has struck me. I've done a lot of work over the years with the Unreasonable Group. I'm going to be going and doing a session with them in October, as a matter of fact. And what's always struck me is how global the entrepreneurs who participate in the program are. They're solving the world's biggest problems, and they're doing it all over the world. And that really is a perspective that I think sometimes is missing from Silicon Valley. So I love that you really place such a strong emphasis on the impact side. Definitely. And I think just growing up in Egypt and seeing a lot of the kind of bigger problems that are more day to day for Egypt, but, you know, non-existent in, in developed markets, it gives you a really a different perspective. And I feel that has also helped us become better investors at Hof. Well, one of the things I've written about the culture in Egypt, which is an amazing culture, one of the things I've said is that the culture, uh, I often describe cultures as either loose or tight. Neither is better than the other. German culture is a very tight culture. Tight. Singaporean <laughs> culture is a very tight culture. Egypt is a very loose and flexible culture. And I actually think that growing up in such a culture is really beneficial for entrepreneurs. Having the sense that there are possibilities, that you know, it's important to say, well, we're not just going to do it the way it's always been done before. And I wonder to the extent, you know, you've experienced both, obviously. You've grown up in Egyptian culture. You went to school, the German school. You went to MIT, which is, you know, a little bit of both. Uh, how do you see that playing out in, in your work as an investor? No, I think, I think it's, it's very interesting because when you look at, for example, Egyptians and their personalities yeah. and where they apply creativity, for example, it's very different than where Americans, for example, apply creativity. Uh, you know, maybe here it's more innovative, here it's more forward thinking. In Egypt, it's about how do I get by day to day uh, in ways that, you know, in new ways. You know, there's always this, when we watch YouTube videos about Egypt, always this is all, you can only find this in Egypt. You know, how we're efficient with, with traffic when, right. you know, you have three lanes and, and there are six cars and, and you know, sharing three lanes. So there's uh, that... Um, inherent entrepreneurial spirit in every one Egyptian, uh, I think when they see more opportunities, when they see more success stories, um, we, you know, they get a lot more encouraged to, to, to go out there and, and, and build. I feel we, we have a very big population. We have 100 million people, for example, in Egypt, and there's a lot that can be done. And I feel that that personality, uh, you know, trait in me and looking at how I grew up as an Egyptian and then moving to the U.S. where... You know, there's a lot more structure to things and there's a lot more, uh, you know, frankly, more opportunities. You, you're able to also adapt where you come from to, to have a unique positioning, to look at, you know, what you do and how to do it better. And I think that's really translated a lot in how we built our firm and our culture at Hoff as well. So I think that's, uh, uh, it's, it's been definitely uh, uh, amazing to have been, you know, to be fr very proud to be Egyptian. <laughs> uh, as well, you should be. Uh, I think that, you know, we've talked about your cultural legacy, but you know, we'd be remiss if we didn't also actually discuss your family legacy. You come from a, a family that's in, achieved incredible things in the entrepreneurial space. Your father, your uncles, your grandfather, legendary figures in Egypt. I can only imagine the value of having these kinds of role models while you were growing up. What kinds of things have you learned from your father and your uncles from that generation, from your grandfather, if you had the opportunity to speak with him? What are some of the lessons you've taken in from these previous generations? Yeah, absolutely. Definitely invaluable experience. And, and you know, that growing up has given me a lot of also unfair advantages that uh, really helped shape who I am today and, and drive my ambition level to see, you know, what they've gone through, what they had to endure. Uh, you know, I was very fortunate to, to have spent time with my grandfather um, growing up as well and, and hearing his stories about how he started off as a farmer and, built, you know, slowly building into a construction business, which then gets nationalized in Egypt and having to restart that over several times. Uh, it really also gives you uh, a sense of, get, you know, constantly remembering 
to be humble, to work hard, and success comes with a lot of factors, you know, including luck, of course, but there is a lot more to it. You know, my father always tells me, you make your own luck. You can't just sit at home, lock yourself up and expect everything to happen for you. So um, what I, you know, learned from that is to always be super ambitious to also realize, well, you know, and be grounded and, and, and know what, what's up there and what's, you know, what I need to uh, solve for to, to achieve some of my goals. And, you know, I think looking at these markets, you know, one thing that's really been you know always stuck in my head is never take no for an answer because you will face so much in life especially being you know from egypt you have a lot more exposure to how an emerging market works to the culture to a country that has a lot of culture um and then also coming here to the us being you know uh, from egypt and then what can i learn as well from here they, there's a, a lot of amazing things that you know bringing these two things together and looking how you know, my family built businesses from emerging markets, how others built businesses here. I, think, I feel like that's how uh, and, and you know, helped position what we've done at Hoff and help really, um, uh, you know, have my imprints sort of on, on, on my career and my goals uh, long term. Right. Well, no pressure, but I know that you got married in the past couple of years. You're probably thinking about family and having your own family. What lessons would you like to then pass on to your children? What are the things that you're going to be trying to, to model for them, to, to place within their minds for that next generation? Absolutely. I think it's uh, a lot of the, the, you know, the morals, the, 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 the guidelines that I, I grew up with. And a lot of it is to do just with uh, you know, who I am as a, as a human being. And you know, family is super important. Um, you know, my wife is a, is a support system where we have definitely very shared views on, on the world and on life. And I feel that's, that's important that you stick by, uh, your ethics and stick by your morals and you apply that across. And I feel sometimes in the day to day, maybe here in New York, a lot of people sort of forget that, Hey, you know, we can stick step back. There's, you know, there's more to life, uh, than negotiating this final, <laughs> uh, deal or getting across the line. So I think, um, you know, a lot of, that, you know, family values, a lot of uh, the personal values I grew up with, there's something that I uh, will definitely want to teach my kids to remain humble, to be, always be grateful and use whatever uh, gifts you have to make a better impact on the world. So if you have more advantages or you're more, advanced, you know, you have more uh, to be able to, to make a difference with, use that to fuel you to strive for even more. Uh, and I think that's the, the mentality that's really shifted across our, our family generations. And it's something that uh, we're proud to, uh, to share, you know, uh, along our way as well. Well, you're certainly doing a great job of carrying on the family legacy. And I know that they're very proud of you. Um, let's Thank talk you. a little bit about Hoff for a second, because we've been focused on the support broader picture. But a lot of our listeners are entrepreneurs. They're very excited about starting a company. And so what should they know about Hoff? How would they work with you? What are the areas that you're really interested in investing in right now? Yeah, absolutely. We look at an, in, in our investments in, in these uh, entrepreneurs as, as a very long-term partnership. We uh, invest when they're very young. We invest knowing that they will learn from mistakes learn, you know, and, and go through a lot to shape kind of the future of their businesses. And it's very important, just like when you're entering a, a marriage, to really understand uh, uh, the mindset of these entrepreneurs, because early days, um, it's really about the people that you work with. It's really about who you want to back that share, uh, you know, the right, the right vision that have, uh, uh the right kind of, um, uh, uh, goals that might meet kind of our ambition levels as well. And I think one thing that we see a lot of is storytelling is great, but building, uh, a sustainable business that makes the impact that you're looking for that what we call generational businesses um it requires a lot right and right. we we try to operate uh like that on our own and what we tell entrepreneurs all the time is uh you know look for investors that will shine on the bad day not when everything is great yes. and at the same time um keep them in mind because they have been the ones that have always been there to support. And a lot of the time, uh, you know, especially during tough times like that, we've also really learned a lot about personalities that we enjoy working with more than others. And this is where really true, true people shine. And, and this is where, you know, stronger bonds uh, uh, form. 
And I feel like that's what we're seeing uh, in the markets right now. We are a, a, a tech agnostic firm. So we, we invest in technology companies that we feel will shape the next 10 years. We try to look uh, far ahead. Obviously, AI is a, is a hot theme, but we, you know, we're, we're investing, but we're, we're obviously mindful of, you know, the current environment. Um, another space that I'm personally looking at very closely is on climate tech mm. and, and clean, clean energy and how, uh, technology, software technology companies, what they're solving and how, and how they're solving and what, you know, we're trying to build internally on sort of subsectors that we like within that space. Uh, and I've always been a, a big investor in fintech because it's one of the very important themes that we see in emerging markets as an example. So we always managed to bring that as well and invest across Africa in fintech. And you look at the statistics of the sort of the underbanked and the unbanked and financial inclusion in our region. And that's one of the top themes and top priorities of countries in our world. So that's been an area that we, I've, or I've personally spent, spent time on. No, and, and I have to agree so strongly with what you said earlier about you know, the kinds of investors you want on your side, people who are going to be there on those tough days. One of the key pieces of advice I always give entrepreneurs is I tell them, you need to do diligence to your investors. And to do that, what you need to do is you need to find some of the deals that failed and talk to those founders. Because it Absolutely. doesn't matter what the investor does when everything's going great and you don't need anything. It's how the investor shows up for you when you're struggling and when the outcome is, is in doubt that really matters so much. Yeah, absolutely. And I think especially in venture, when there's a, you know, there's a lot of venture, everyone tries to call themselves a venture investor. Mm -hmm. I think the way to stand out is to, build, you know, to, to, to do what you say you're going to do as well, because everyone talks, everyone says I can do everything. So to also set expectations and to truly be helpful when, when they need the support and helpful uh, not just in the formal board settings or, you know, informal meetings, but it's really just being there, being available, but also opening up uh, your, your talent book, your network, um, which has been something that we feel helps, helps a lot. And, and, and it's a time as well where talent is, is starting to be available. So we're just helping companies as well shift mindsets and, and navigate when they need to reprioritize certain elements about their business. We try to be the first ones that voice that and, and tell them, you know, you take what you think is right, but we want to be here and we want to be supportive of, of the path that we're suggesting. Yeah, and I think that's very important. There's been this craze among venture investors to compete to be the most quote unquote founder friendly, which in practice meant trying to buddy up to them and agree with everything they did. And I think that the smart founders want somebody who's more of a partner, somebody who is not going to tell them what to do because, of course, it's their job to actually run the company. We as investors aren't operational. But someone who will say if they think they're doing something wrong or say if they think they should be doing something that they're not. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we, we see a variety of founders. I think, you know, there is also a bit of uh, e ego immaturity sometimes when dealing with, uh, with investors. And, and the other way around as well, there are investors that are, uh, not friendly or, you know, they turn or they lose focus as well or lose interest. And that's when you really expect them to be there. Um, and they, they suddenly show up when there's some, you know, legality or something that they have to decide on and then, you know, they get caught up. So, uh, we feel like also building that personal relationships with the entrepreneurs and, and with the teams, uh, not just with the founders that we back, but we try to spend time with their teams as well and get to know, uh, uh, you know, how they hire and think through a lot of the, the things that we assess in, in, in founders in general, the best way to do that is in practicality, right? If you sit and you have a pitch, you know, storytelling, as I said at the beginning, uh, is, is a very, is a skill that's now starting to really be commoditized. <laughs> storytelling is critical, it's important, it's powerful, but yeah. don't mistake storytelling for accomplishment. Yeah, exactly. Now, one last area of inquiry, because you know, I think somebody can look from the outside at the profile of ANSI and say, wow, this guy has just always known exactly what to do. He's made every right move. Everything is, has done, gone well for him. He's built this incredible firm. But I think that that means that they don't often see that regardless of what you've accomplished in life, even those people who've accomplished so much, there have been struggles along the way. There have been failures. There have been things that you learn from. And I think we do everyone a disservice when we make them feel like, oh, I can't do something because my life is this, not this one long steady ascent uh, with everything always going right. 
What are some of the struggles that you had along the way? What did you learn from them? And, and what would you share about those struggles with the folks who are listening? Yeah. First of all, I don't see, personally, between me and myself, I don't see me having accomplished anything yet. I uh, look at these, you know, steps and milestones that you, you know, targets that you want to reach towards a greater goal. Um, so, you know, which, which keeps me, me driven every day to, to strive for more and strive for better and, uh, and to do more. Um, when, when you look at this side and being, you know, um, you know, being like that, it's the most important thing for me is to look at where, what went wrong, why it went wrong, and how to avoid that. I think one of the most important things in life is you won't improve without making mistakes. But if you're naive to these mistakes or you, you, you shy away or you run away and you don't face your, the, 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 you face reality, you face the issue, you probably will repeat that and you, you won't realize that long term. So we, you know, along the way for, you know, from a half perspective, lots of lessons learned. I think it's, you know, both from, uh, you know, how you, how we hire the cultural fit is just as important as the skill set, uh, the ambition levels, the, the, you know, the personalities, um, also on investments, um, learning how to, you know, take a step back and decide for our own. A lot, a lot of venture can happen very quickly. So a lot of time you, you know, if you're inexperienced or you, you get excited too quickly, you, you know, playing devil's advocate in this space is very important uh, and really standing up for what went wrong on investment decisions. I think that's the best way to learn. And I feel like uh, it couldn't co have come at a better time. I did feel just looking at 2021, wi while in 2021 that you know, things are happening too quickly, everything's too good. Yes. And, you know, when everything is good, it's probably a time to sell. And when things are not that good, that's when opportunities uh, arise. And, and, you know, we've definitely, as a firm, we grew uh, in, in mentality, we grew in, in sort of uh, experience, I feel, a lot more in the last kind of two years uh, versus kind of when you first get going and when everything's kind of good. So you also, you know, between you and your LPs, you also learn uh, how they think at, at a, on a bad day, how, what issues they are facing so that you understand, uh, you know, as well, take a step back, look at things from a from a more you know macro perspective and that's something i feel has again continued to help us towards our goals at this firm and continue to build a culture as you know of transparency for example we learn how it's so important to over communicate or you know versus under communicate for example with investors um so there's a lot of these small things that come with time uh they have to be really conscious of so that you can continue to strive to being a, a tier one firm. Because to us, the firm is not just about investing in venture companies. It's how you build everything, the compliance side of things, the operations, your finances, your you know, LP management, your investor relations, who you work with, who you speak with. So there's, there's a lot to it. And, and, and I feel it all plays a role in building a successful business that has a good reputation in the market. Absolutely. And with all of these things, I think you have to have the courage to stare the failure or the uh, the struggle in the face, not to avoid it because it makes you feel pain, but to embrace it, to see what you can learn from it, to recognize you've already paid the price for this lesson. You'd better actually take that lesson in. So I love that attitude. Yeah. And of course, just one final thing on that is, uh, you know, looking at your underwriting and how that has maps kind of performance, right? So I think that's mm -hmm. a core to how we look at investing and uh, you, you have to stick to it to really improve on, on your decision making and your investment uh, um, um, mentality. Yes, on a non-public venue, we could talk a lot about some of the other things that folks did in the past <laughs> four or five years, but we'll save that for when we're not uh, recording and broadcasting. Uh, Ansi, I cannot thank you enough for taking time out of your busy schedule to share this with us. I really enjoyed getting a chance to learn more about some of the perspectives that you brought from this very unique background and to learn more and share with other people what Hoff is working on, what you're working on. Congratulations, I know you feel like you haven't accomplished these great things. Uh, I can tell you that building a venture firm, building a culture is not easy. And so doing that is quite remarkable and I look forward to seeing the things that you're gonna be doing over the next 10, 20, 30 years having impact all over the world. Chris, it's a real pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.